Okay, good morning everybody. I think I know everybody in here, so I'm not even gonna bother introducing myself. Um, we have Jan Hunter with us this morning, and immediately following her, we're gonna have Matt Ross from Owens speaking also. So anyway, uh, Jan is with us from Wild Ones, and she's got a lot of information about natives and other things, and she even brought some cute little butterflies with her. So anyway, um, before you leave, don't forget to pet the butterflies. And uh, <laughs> Can you pet them? No. No, okay. I mean, can. Yeah, right. So anyway, Welcome, Jan. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, I did bring some monarchs. They were laboratory raised um, in Kansas generations ago, and they were even in outer space, um, literally, <laughs> on the space station. I have information on monarchs. Now I'll be talking a little bit more about monarch butterflies. I brought C. Native plant seeds, everybody may go home with one individual packet from the bag, not the whole bag, please. Um, I've had whole bags walk off. So I'll be talking about some of these plants. There's descriptions and pictures of each one. On your way out, feel free to grab those. I have business cards, wild ones display, and if I could get people to sign in, I just need a name. I also have a space for email. If you want a free complimentary newsletter emailed to you from Wild Ones, you'll get three free ones. I'm trying to get you hooked as a member. And I'm going to talk more about Wild Ones and hopefully we might get a member or two out of the talk. Let's see. My name is Jan Hunter. I have a nursery down in Bowling Green called Naturally Native Nursery, and I carry only native plants, and I'll talk more about what native plants are and why they're important. Let's see, I can look back here. Upper left corner is Wild One's national logo. I am on the national board of directors. Under that is the Oak Openings region chapter of Wild Ones. We have a local chapter that meets up, at, up in Sylvania. Um, about nine months of the year and then in the summer we usually do hikes and garden tours and things. Uh, very informative speakers and talks, good place to come and visit, learn more. Under that is Ohio Invasive Plants Council. I just stepped off the board of that. I was on that. Nature Conservancy is where I got my start years ago in Idaho and then in Indiana doing restoration work. And under that is the Lucas Toledo Rain Garden Initiative. I am the, on the technical committee of that. That's a local group that helps people install rain gardens. I actually pulled the rain garden information out of the PowerPoint because I, there was too much stuff. And we can do that another time if you want. But Wild Ones, um, we take hikes. This is a hike up at um, Nichols Arboretum. Matt Ross back here led the hike actually. This is the Wild Ones local chapter group. And he talked about trees and shrubs last fall and he's gonna do it again this fall, so don't miss that. Wild Ones also collects seeds, similar to this. Puts them in little packets. Um, it's a good fun event in the fall. Uh, people collect out of their gardens or this might be at Kitty Todd with permission. Um, and then we give them away at the seed swap in Toledo in the spring. That just happened about a month ago. We also help other organizations. This is a kind of a ditch restoration installation at, name that prairie in Sylvania. <laughs> it's part of Olanda Park System, can't think of the name. Um, but we installed thousands and thousands of plants on the ditch bank and up above. And that's just volunteer work. We like to help the local parks. We have a small butterfly garden going in at 577 Foundation in Perrysburg. That's my little helper, my three-year-old grandson. He helped install the sign. We just got uh, that area cleaned up in the fall and we'll be planting a lot of native plants in there this spring. 
Wild Ones. If you become a member, you have publications and downloads on the website, lots of information. We have blogs where people just ask questions or send a picture in and say, what kind of plant is this and whatever. Ecoscaper program is sort of similar to Master Gardeners, only it's really, really cheap and you do it on your own. You don't have to go to hours and hours and hours of classes, um, but you get a certificate at the end that hopefully you learned something about native plants and natural landscapes. Wild Ones Journal, we have a hard copy journal that we mail out. Um, from the national organization, and we also have the local chapter one that's really good. Website is excellent for information. SFE seeds for education. There's grant money for native seeds. Uh, we just are giving out the grants right now, or just gave them out. Uh, we do it once a year, so it won't be till next winter. Partnerships, we partner with other organizations. Um, Monarch Joint Venture is one, and we're promoting Monarchs this year. We're working with them. And local monthly meetings and hikes, I already talked about. Geologic history of Northwest Ohio. Glaciers covered the area 12,000 years ago, receded, and what is left, and from that time, is what we call native. Um, it shaped the land, it formed the hills and valleys and scraped areas, and then the beach, beaches that were formed from the lakes. Lake Erie was one much larger. Um, you get the oak opening sand dunes, as well as some dunes down in Bowling Green and over in Wauseon. What are native plants? Native plants are those, grasses, trees, shrubs, and vines that were here at the time of early settlement. So three, four hundred years ago, when Europeans first started coming over here, kings of their home countries sent their best botanists and their best scientists over here to record, bring back, study, get specimens of the plants that were here. So we're very fortunate. We have a pretty good record of what was here then. Um, native plants. Add color, structure, and texture to the landscape. Hopefully in the back area here at the church, in the back acreage part, we can end up with something like that. Um, native plants are used for erosion control. This is a site over in Youngstown, very steep slope, gravel, crummy soil. It's all old fill. A couple of years later, it looked like that with native plants, installed seeds and plants. We use native plants for wildlife habitat. All of our native wildlife depends on our native plants for food, shelter, nesting sites. They evolved together since the glaciers receded. So the plants and animals have a relationship that they depend on one another. The plants actually need the birds to spread their seeds, and they need the bees to spread their pollen, and the animals need the plants for food, for shelter. In the spring, 96% of our birds eat insects or feed insects to their young. The rest of the time, they generally eat seeds and berries and nuts. Um, so in the spring, you'll see a lot of insects going on. And in the fall, you'll see the nuts and berries. So they kind of evolve together and they match up, they line up. Bees pollinate our food and our flowers and our trees and shrubs. Monarchs, you got the monarch caterpillar on the orange butterfly weed. Um, their only food source as a caterpillar is the milkweed and there are several different species of milkweeds but they have to have milkweed in order to survive. So you can create a small wildlife habitat area in your yard. This is a before and after of a house we did in uh, Woodville. They were tired of mowing so much lawn and they said we want a garden and they love it and they're taking good care of it, it looks great. If you put in native plants and you don't use pesticides you will see snakes and bees and birds and turtles if it's wet and spiders. <clears throat> Native plants 
support 35 times more caterpillar species than exotic species of plants. So if you have a native viburnum next to a non-native burning bush, you're going to find 35 times more caterpillars and insects and butterflies and bees. Um, this is a small scaled down chart of cost savings lawn as opposed to prairie or a natural area. So it's a, it's a one acre piece and if you include watering and fertilizing and mowing a lawn and prairie maintenance, which might include some mowing, but not as much, and maybe a burn. Um, and yeah. So in a 10-year period, you're going to save $23,000. It is a cost saving. So areas, businesses, schools that have a very large plot of ground that they're mowing year after year after year, they can save a lot of money over time. Um, this is a prairie in Youngstown, right downtown, middle of the city, super crummy soil. Um, just a suburban lot with all native plants. Beautiful home, that's my daughter's house. Um, this is in the city of Toledo. The driveway that you see in the lower left hand corner, the house is to the left, and that's his neighbor's yard, that's all the grass. So he's out there mowing and fertilizing and watering, and the guy with the native plants, that's Dallas Howard's house. Um, this is a rain garden at the Methodist Church in Toledo on Monroe. I'm not going to talk too much about rain gardens, um, but, but anyway, Seamus and Eileen's house. Um, this is in Toledo. It's a mix of non-natives and natives. You can have both. Heather Carter's house. They kind of went all out. Big garden out front. Fine. Smaller garden in the front of a house. Purple cone flowers, very pretty. And probably some black-eyed Susan, brown-eyed Susan, something like that. Cultivars and varieties. When you go to conventional greenhouses, garden centers, Home Depot, Lowe's, and you pick up your spring plants. Cultivars, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, are plants that have been propagated and selected for specific characteristics. Either they're weeping, or they're variegated, or they're dwarf. Um, so they've taken either a native species from America or some other country, and they've done something to it to make it more desirable on the market, not necessarily more desirable for plant for animals and insects. Invasive and exotic species, those are the ones we don't want to be planting, selling, trading, buying, things like buckthorn, purple loosestrife, pride mighties. Um, they're very damaging to the ecosystem and to our wildlife. On the left is a native Coreopsis. On the right is a cultivated one. It's been bred specifically to have more petals. It may have less nectar. I'll talk a little bit more about nectar in just a second. It's got more petals, which means some insects can't access the nectar if there is nectar there. Nectar, which is different in each species of plant, is a very complex compound made of amino acids, different nutrients, water, sugars, proteins, fats. So it varies from plant to plant. Certain insects will go to certain plants because it has the nectar that they desire. Pollen, bees collect pollen. They use that as a food also. Um, and it's different in each plant. Native columbine on the left cultivated ones on the right, just as pretty, but they may not have the same nectar, the color may not attract our native insects. Same with the roses, that's our native rose on the left, it's wide open, they can get to the pollen, they can get to the nectar, the one on the right, can't even get to it. Um, these are some exotic species. 
Upper left is Japanese barberry. If you have it, rip it out, please. Uh, it does escape. The birds eat the seeds and spread it to natural areas, and then it costs a lot of money to get rid of them. Butterfly bush, I'm a little up in the air on that one. It's not invasive here. It is invasive in other parts of the country. Um, it could become more invasive, as some plants do. Bush honeysuckle on the lower left. A lot of people love it. It smells great. It's got a pretty flower, but it's extremely invasive and crowds out and shades out lots of our native species. It gets into a woods and you lose all your spring ephemerals. It, it leaves out earlier in the spring, so it shades the ground quicker. Burning bush, escaping into the wild, very pretty. They're wonderful native alternatives. And just because they eat it doesn't mean it's good for them. People always say, well, I've got all these butterflies and hummingbirds coming to my butterfly bush. Well, okay, but it might not be good for them. It's, they haven't evolved over eons. Um, people eat at McDonald's, but it's not good for them. $137 billion a year are spent on exotics control in this country. It's a lot of money that we could be putting toward education or health or whatever. Wildflowers, please do not confuse native plants for wildflowers. Big difference, not the same. Um, University of Washington did a little study on these little seed packets that people give away or you buy at the store and they have a beautiful picture of wonderful flowers on the front. Of those 19 packets that they grew out in a greenhouse, um, eight of them contained three to 13 invasive species. Eight had seeds considered noxious weeds. So sometimes there's things like spotted knapweed in there, even though it's not on the label. Um, so by buying these things, you're spreading a very harmful weed. A third of them had no contents listed or wrong contents listed. It might say it's got black-eyed Susan and blazing star and whatever, but when you grow them out, those things aren't really in there. Um, stay away from wild flowers. You'd be better off to plant something like this. It's plastic flowers. At least they're not going to invade anything. Pollination, I'm going to talk a little bit about pollination and why it's important and, and why it works and how it works. And it's the whole thing, the insect comes and takes the pollen from one flower to the next so that it gets fertilized and it makes a seed and propagates. Bees are what we use, honeybees are what a lot of people use a lot of commercially. Um, some plants are wind pollinated, all your grasses, corn. Pine trees, a lot of trees are wind pollinated. They don't depend on the insects. Flowers attract pollinators with fragrance color and nectar guides. The two flowers up at the top, the yellow and the blue, they're really both the same flower under ultraviolet light, um, it show, which bees see. It shows what the bee sees, and he sees this thing in the center <clears throat> where the nectar is. So, Plants have evolved to have these nectar guides. They could be stripes, like in the spring beauty. They could be a different color, like in the hibiscus down here. Um, but the center of the flower usually is advertising, here's the stuff you want, come and get it. And by the way, while you're here, pick up some pollen and take it to my buddy next door. All kinds of insects um, spread pollen from plant to plant. This is a wasp, this is a moth. We don't usually think of moths as pollinators, but they're really good. Some, most moths are night flying. This happens to be a day flying one. Butterflies are good. They're not the greatest pollen spreaders. Beetles, beetles, excellent. Millions of beetles, more beetles than any other insect, I think. Uh, some kind of insect. Get any entomologists in the crowd here? <laughs> I forget what that guy is. <clears throat> Another wasp. Um, and wasps and bees, natives, are, they, they, they don't bother you. Honeybees have a hive that they protect, so they tend to sting a lot more readily. Our native bees mostly are solitary. They either don't have a stinger or they don't want to sting you. Um, the only time they do is when they're really, really threatened. 
talk a little bit more, I think, about our native bees and hummingbirds. Pretty good pollinators, um, but they're very specialized in the type of flower that they can get the nectar out of. Insects do a lot more than just pollinate. They clean up dead animals and insects, take them back to their nest for their young. They pollinate. They keep other insect populations in check. Things like praying mantis and jumping spiders. They keep a lot of the um, and ladybugs with aphids. They keep the pest insects in control. They aerate the soil. And they become food for birds and other animals. One in three bites of our food is insect pollinated. Beans and nuts, spinach. We wouldn't have Popeye if we didn't have insects. Berries, all our berries, a lot of fruits. Coffee even and chocolate, insect pollinated. Yeah, chocolate and coffee, my two favorites. Um, <laughs> insects. Ooh, they're working right now, trying to get mason bees, which are our native bee, to do some of our pollinating um, of our crops, large, large, large farm, factory farm, field crops. It, one mason bee can do the work of 100 honeybees. All bees are shaped different. They're attracted to different plants, different flowers. If you want to attract bees to your yard, you can make bee boxes. These are for solitary bees. They go in, they lay an egg, they fly away, they never come back. They don't take care of their young, so they don't sting you because they have nothing to protect or worry about. Ground nesting bees, about a third of our bees are ground nesters. They make holes in the ground or they use somebody else's holes. Like the bumblebee moves into a mouse or mole hole and sets up house there. If you have sandy soil, usually in the upper right hand corner, you see all those little sand mounds. In the spring, you'll see them. Those are good bees. They won't bother you. They're fun to watch. They're small, they're cool. Um, there are no known cases of people going into anaphylactic shock from a solitary native bee sting. So people say, oh, I'm allergic to bees. Nobody, not a native bee. Honeybees are not native. Honeybees are from Europe. So all of our native bees, nobody's allergic to them, ever. <laughs> well, you gotta identify them real quick. <laughs> Chances are they're native bees because there's more of them around. Um, like I said, Wild Ones is working with monarch butterflies and monarch watch and monarch larva monitoring project. Um, I raise a few monarchs at the nursery. Mostly I just leave them outside, but I keep a couple on hand to show people. And I test for OE spores, uh, which are uh, a disease they get, a fungus, uh, what's a spore, how do I, fungus? Okay. Test um, the adults, it's very easy to do, and then I send that to University of Georgia, and they work with Monarch Watch, and they're trying to monitor the OE spore spread. Um, there is a uh, milkweed plant, it's called tropical milkweed, it's on the market, it's very attractive, it's not native to here, it's native farther south. It blooms later in the season than our native milkweeds. So if you have it, if you grow it, if you plant it, the monarchs will stay longer and spread more disease. They're finding that the OE spores where the tropical milkweed is growing is more of a problem. The OE spores kill the monarchs and it pass, the, the female passes it on to its eggs and you know, so the less, the less the monarchs stay up north when they're supposed to be going to Mexico, the better. So don't plant the tropical milkweed, please. Uh, monarchs are a poster child for the environment. They're familiar, they're big, they're pretty, people like them, people know them, they can relate to them. 
but a lot of the things that we do to protect the monarchs, we're protecting a lot of other species as well. These are all the groups, some of the groups, I think there's even some more with the um, monarch joint venture. There's a lot of organizations working together to protect the monarchs and the monarchs habitat. I won't go too much into Roundup Ready crops and the size of commercial farms that are enormous, the lack of milkweed between here and Mexico, which the monarchs need to survive, is diminishing. Last year's records of monarch populations in Mexico are way, 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 way down. Um, we need to plant more milkweed. We need to leave more milkweed on roadsides and fence rows and wherever we can. Um, if you come to the nursery, I give away a free milkweed plant for every purchase. And monarchs, as we know, come up from Mexico where they spend the winter and they travel all the way up to southern Canada. Along the way, they lay their eggs. They need the milkweed. If there's no milkweed, they won't lay their eggs. And in the fall, they go back down to Mexico. They all go to one spot everything east of the Rocky Mountains goes to Mexico. Everything on the west coast hangs out on the west coast where it's nice and warm and cozy. This is what they look like on the trunk of a tree. Those are millions of monarchs and millions and millions of monarchs are all over the trees in Mexico in the mountains. Um, that's a picture on the left of trees that are just loaded. If you haven't ever had the opportunity, it's worth a trip. <laughs> it's very cool. Um, monarch caterpillar is the orange and black, or not orange, yellow and black and white. Feeds on milkweed. As an adult, they nectar on any flower. Looks a lot like a viceroy butterfly, but the viceroy has the two little lines on the hind wings, the kind of horizontal lines going across. The monarch does not, female monarch does not have the two spots. You can't really see where the arrow is pointing. The two spots, I guess I have a pointer here. That's the male monarch that has these two very small black dots. The female doesn't have it. So if you're trying to identify um, the male from the female. Does the picture look like the same family? No. Nope. Viceroy is not. They don't feed on milkweed. They don't. Nothing. Nothing the same. They just kind of look alike. So some people think it's a monarch, but it isn't. It's a viceroy. Viceroys are a little bit smaller, too, if you get used to Seeing a lot of monarchs, you'll know a viceroy right away. Are they still big butterflies? Pardon? Are they still big butterflies? Oh, monarch or viceroys, yes, good butterflies. Good to have. They feed on willows is one of their host plants. They they have a lot of host. Take care of them. Yeah, oh yeah. All butterflies. We love butterflies. Um, this is a female laying eggs on the flower, which is okay. They usually lay them on the undersides of a leaf, but they can lay it on any part of the milkweed plant. <clears throat> the upper left-hand corner, the teeny, teeny, teeny white dot, that's the egg. I go out and count those in our, at our nursery in the gardens um, every Sunday, and I compile that data and send it to University of Minnesota, and they work with Monarch Watch, um, protecting monarchs. So you'll see the little teeny tiny egg, and then it hatches out, and it eats the shell that it's in, and then it starts eating the leaf, so you see a little hole in the leaf. But the caterpillar is so tiny, you usually see the hole before you see the caterpillar. And then it molts five <coughs> times, and then it gets eh, about that big. And then it'll turn into a chrysalis, and then into a butterfly. Um, left is the J. Before it makes a chrysalis, it'll climb up under in this. It's in a cage thing, a netting thing. Um, but out in the wild, they'll do it under a, a leaf or a branch or a fence or on a building, anywhere, tables, chairs, and they'll make their chrysalis that looks like that, and they're pretty spectacular, and they'll stay in the chrysalis for about two weeks, and then they'll climb out, and those are just fresh new hatchlings, 
This is at the nursery. We raise a few. Um, the one on the left, a praying mantis has a hold of. All part of life and death. And on the right is a soldier ambush bug. Um, got the monarch caterpillar and is sucking the juices out of it. So there are predators on the monarchs as well as all the other harmful things that we do. Scott had this beautiful <laughs> monarch swallowtail, whatever, um, advertising their wonderful products, which aren't so wonderful. And Monarch Watch got a hold of them and said, take that thing off. It looks too much like a monarch. And they did. So thank you, Scott. You did one thing right. Uh, you can set up a monarch way station, which is nothing more than providing food, shelter, milkweed plants, water at home, at school, at church. And you can buy a little sign to put out there. But it's just a way of advertising what you're doing with your native plants and your milkweed plants. 90% of Ohio's wetlands have been destroyed. They've been drained. Obviously, the Great Black Swamp. 70% um, of our eastern forests have been logged extensively. 99.9% .9 of our black oak savannas are gone forever. They only occur around the Great Lakes. And they've been farmed, built on houses, schools, businesses. Um, so if you get up to Kitty Todd or Irwin Prairie or any of those, Black Savannas, there's only 0.1% left in the world of them, so they're very much more endangered than the rainforest or even the Arctic. And 99% of our prairies in the Midwest have been destroyed for farming, for corn and soybeans. So if you can put little bit of prairie plants along the way in our gardens, um, the parks and the nature preserves can't do it all. They're very small in comparison. If everybody put a little bit in their backyard, the world would be a better place. Wrap up benefits of native plants, cost savings, erosion control, wildlife habitat, beauty, healthier air and water. They use native plants to clean up brown fields, polluted ground um, <clears throat> and water. They install wetlands to soak up pollutants. Food, medicine, fuel, and fiber, we've gotten away from that, but I think more and more people are getting back into how to use native plants for medicinal purposes, edibility. Um, they use switchgrass to burn with coal. It makes coal burn cleaner. They use it for ethanol, switchgrass. Native plants are low maintenance. Yeah. The orange butterfly Does the orange butterfly need, um, need one? It's a native Okay. Is that native? Yes. Yes. The orange milkweed, orange butterfly, milkweed, people call it butterfly weed, butterfly milkweed. You do. Yes. Yes, and hard to grow for some people. Really? It's good. Milkweeds are necessary. <laughs> and they're beautiful, and they're very fragrant. Um, the orange milkweed doesn't have the milky sap. That's the only one of our milkweeds that doesn't. So I call it butterfly weed as opposed to butterfly milkweed, even though it's the same thing. Um, native plants are lower cost and better for the earth. And they return the organics to the soil. So if you have a prairie and you burn it or you let it lay, that's returning all that organic matter that insects can use. And that's all I have. Uh, <laughs> questions, comments? Blood flower. Thank you. It's a beautiful, oh, it's gorgeous. gorgeous. I used to have some. 
<laughs> Somebody gave it to me, and I thought it was so pretty. But I found out it is not good for the monarchs. I mean, it has the nectar, and yes, it's a milkweed, and they can feed on it, and blah, blah, blah. But it's the bloom time thing. Mm-hmm. Yes. I bring it inside. Yes. Put it in a bottle. Put it through a bottle. Put With it, milkweed. Okay. okay. And you can keep it for months. The whole thing happens. Nothing's going to eat it. It's safe. And then it's, and then it's ready to take its first months by the end of the year. Beautiful. That's yeah. fine. Yes. Fine. Yes. Kids love it. It's, it's a great way to introduce kids to nature and get them more involved and more interested in our natural world. Kids are getting away from that big time. You want natives? Yeah. Yes. Um, I know a nursery in Bowling Green. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a few others around the country, but you want to get the most local seed that you can get. And yes, we sell bulk seeds. We sell seeds. We sell little little tiny start plants. We sell bigger lands. I'm bringing seeds on my property also. I want to have half acre strips that I like to turn back to the Okay, and there's certain specific species that yeah. will provide you with the most nectar. My wife is a lawyer, so she just said, I thought she was the most sort of bullshit lawyer. And I said, no, because it doesn't add nectar. And if you do look through it and look more about the book, half the stuff in there is not good for you. Right. A lot of that stuff, <laughs> stuff, a lot of the seeds in your wildflower containers, wildflower mixes are from China, they're from Europe, they're from Africa, they're cheap. They spread, they're bad, they're nasty, most of them won't grow anyway. A lot of them are annuals in the first year. You might have a lot of black-eyed Susan and Cosmos and the next year, nothing. I get more people come into the nursery and say, oh, I spread this stuff, now I can't get rid of it. Or I want something different, or it didn't come back. So stick with your natives. It's adapted to the climate, to the weather, to the cold, to the heat, to the drought, to the floods. Put the right plant in the right place, and you'll have no problems. Anything else? OK. <laughs> Thank you. Feel free to get seeds. I've got pamphlets and information up here. Um, thank you for your time. Come visit at the nursery. And I'm sure